Be opening your Bibles this morning to Matthew chapter 12. We'll be there in just a few moments. It's so good to see each one of you. It's so good to know that you have put forth the effort to be here, to spend this time in worship to God, to spend this time in, in study, and as we follow the guidance of the Word of God out of 1 Corinthians chapter 14, that we can edify each other, build each other up, in the most holy faith, that we can encourage each other, that we can, as we have sung together, that we can speak together through these songs, and that we can admonish each other and teach each other, and that we can spend time quite literally in the Word of God to learn more perfectly the things that God wants us to do. And, and this, is, this is so important to our lives, so important to our lives. We give time for many other things. And there are many other things that distract us from this, which is our purpose. This is reason, the reason that we are, are living, that we will serve God. And when all of these things around us are gone, and one day they will be, when, when we are no longer here in the flesh, and one day that also will be the case. Then we'll realize how truly important this time was. And how we need to spend more time like this together. Not less, but more. Searching and finding and making time in our schedules. To be together as, as friends, as brothers and sisters in Christ. To be together in small groups and large groups like this assembly. To glorify God and to encourage each other. One day that will be so obvious to us how important that is. And I hope that it can become more and more important to us as we live. You could not hide Jesus even if you wanted to. You could not hide Jesus even if you wanted to. People have tried. Pe people tried. There were times when Jesus even wanted to get away and, and find some quiet space. It was, it was impossible uh, as he was closer to Jerusalem because so many people saw him and, and recognized him. And, and if they didn't see him, they saw one of his disciples or one of the apostles. And, and they knew that surely Jesus must be close because these people were always there. And then when, when he even went through Samaria, the land of, of, of the the Jewish people who had intermarried with the people of Cana and, and had become uh, a, a mixed blood of, of people, which, which most of us today are, uh, a, a mixed blood. Uh, but it, but it, was, it was so important to, to them then 
that, that they maintained their, their purity, uh, for that was the family line that Jesus was going to come through and that God had promised. And, and so they, they were maintaining that. And, and when Jesus went through Samaria, it was even difficult because people knew that he was coming. Not knew that he was coming that day or that week, but they knew that God's word had said that he was coming. And when he went further uh, north, out from uh, Judea and then Samaria into Galilee, and, and even when he was in the region of the Gentiles, uh, even, even there, uh, when he would draw aside into someone's house, it, it was impossible, it, w- it was simply impossible for people not to know that he was there. And, and they came, word spread. It spread so quickly. When Jesus would withdraw into the desert regions to, to be alone with his own apostles, they followed him. Uh, not, not even taking time to make preparations for, for a, a, a trip out into uh, the, the desert area or, or, or to have provisions should they be there overnight. But, but they, they followed him anyway because they wanted to hear what he had to say and they wanted the benefit they wanted the physical benefit of being in his presence, that, that he could heal their sick, and they knew that. And, and no one was questioning that Jesus had that power. And, and, they, and they brought their, their sick and, 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 and distressed people, and, and Jesus healed them. He healed them by the hundreds, and he healed them by the thousands. And the Scripture will often say that, that when they, they brought their sick to Jesus, that Jesus healed them all. They recognized that. Jesus did not come as a rebel. He did not come marching on the Capitol. He did not come shouting for attention. He didn't didn't come saying, you'd better listen to me. He, He didn't come trying to overthrow a government. In fact, while he was here, he lived in submission to the government. Even though at the end of his life, as he's standing before Pilate, the governor, he told Pilate, he said, you would not even be governor if God had not allowed it to happen. But he still submitted to this man. And and when, when Pilate finally uh, had, had washed his hands of Jesus and, and, and said, take him and, and, and scourge him and, and do with him as you, as you will. Jesus did not stand up and say, wait a minute. Wait a minute, you cannot do that to me. You have no authority to do that to me. I'm the Son of God. He could have spoken the words and it would have stopped everything. But he didn't. And I want you to listen this morning as as God is speaking to us in in Matthew chapter 12. What God had prophesied uh, in in the book of Isaiah. An amazing reading. uh, And and even even more than just what we're reading here. But but if you listen to what God is saying in, in Matthew chapter 12, beginning in verse 18, God's speaking about Jesus, His Son. He says, Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall proclaim justice to the Gentiles. That's us. That's us. We ought to be saying, thank you, Lord, this morning. Because of what God had planned. Not not just for the coming of Jesus through, through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not just the coming of, of, of salvation through through the line of the Hebrew family, the Jewish people. And we do owe them a debt of gratitude. We, we do owe them respect for that. Don't, don't, don't miss that. that that's, that's important. But, but not respect above God. So listen to what he says. And he shall proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel, nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A battered reed he will not break off, and a smoldering wick he will not put out, until he leads justice to victory, and in his name the Gentiles will hope. 
Listen to those words. My servant. My servant. My beloved. We, we've, we've heard God say that this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased when Jesus was, was faithful to God's command to, to all of Israel. When, when, when they were told to, to repent and to be baptized. That's exactly what they were told to do. Very, very similar to, to what God tells us to do. But Israel was told to, to repent, for the kingdom of God was at hand. And, and when they came, they understood that that repentance involved baptism. And it wasn't repentance unless baptism had taken place. So that their sins would be washed away. Now that did not make them Christians. They were not baptized into Christ because Christ had not died yet. But it made them faithful, obedient children of God Children of Abraham, following exactly what God intended for them. So whenever they came, and, and Jesus came also, and, and John speaks about Jesus, and, and, and that's so important whenever John is talking about Jesus, and, and, and we'll be there next. And in fact, go to John chapter 1 and, and listen to what John is saying about Jesus. Because Jesus has come that day, and he's standing there with all of us sinners. If we were, if we were transported back then, and, and that's what God's doing in His Word. He's inviting us to come and stand there and witness these things. That's why He has us read His Word. And He's wanting us to, to invest ourselves into it and, and be moved. You know what happens whenever you read a novel that you like. You know what happens whether your, your like is, is, is in futuristic kind of things or space and technology or, or whether you like westerns and you read out of, out of Louis L'Amour or, or whether you like romances and you go back and even read some of those from, from back in the medieval times. If, if, if you're someone that's caught up in, in, into King Arthur and, and the round table and you go back and you read about that, as you're reading, your mind takes you there, doesn't it? And you see those places. I understand that. God understands that. And so He's given us His Word, and He wants us to go and be there. He invites us to be there. And to, to be there when Moses was, was receiving the law from God. To be there when, when Elijah was, was simply praying to God to, to light the fire of the altar of God in the contest on Mount Carmel but between the, the prophets of, of Baal and of Jezebel. Some 400 prophets of, of Jezebel and 450 prophets of Baal. 850 prophets and standing against the prophet of God, one man, 850 to one, in incredible odds. But nothing happened to their altar when they asked their God, when they asked Baal, the representative of Satan, to, to light their altar. And then Elijah simply bows down. God wants us there to see this. But he doesn't just say, light the fire. He has them pour, uh, dig a ditch around it and pour barrels of water on it. And then he says, light the fire. And God not only lit the fire and consumed the, the sacrifice and consumed the wood, He even consumed the stones of the altar and licked up the water, licked up, or the fire licked up the water out of the trench. And all of Israel fell down. God wants us to see that. All of Israel, all of Israel fell on their face before God. And they cried out, the Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. And then God directed Elijah to tell the people, you take these 850 prophets and you take them down into that valley, right there, that valley, and you kill them. The false prophets could not stand against God. And so John is here and he's baptizing people. And, and he stops during the process. Jesus, the Son of God, is standing there with us. He's standing with sinners 
waiting to be baptized by John because God had commanded it. See that in your mind. And listen to what God says through John. John answered them and said, I baptize in water, but, one, but, but among you stands one whom you do not know. Among you stands one whom you do not know. And can you see the people looking around? Who are we talking about? I can even see some of the leaders of the Jews. Some, some of the, the, the Pharisees in, in, in their fine clothes that they've come out in. And, and they're probably being careful not to brush up too closely to some of these more common people. And, and, and no one would have picked Jesus out. No one would have picked Jesus out. He's the son of a carpenter. He grew up in poverty. He tells his disciples that follow him, he says the foxes have holes to live in, they're dens, and, and the birds have nests, but the Son of Man does not even have a place to lay down his head. I don't even have a house. I don't even have a bed any longer. They wouldn't have picked out Jesus. Some, some of the Pharisees are, are leaders of the Jews when John says, among you stands one whom you do not know. They're probably going, maybe it's me. Maybe he's finally going to give recognition to me of how important I am. Because he will go on to say, the, the one I, that I'm not even worthy to, to stoop down and unlatch his sandals. I'm not even worthy to untie the, 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 the leather thongs that are around his, his feet there. I'm not even worthy to be his servant. And oh, I can see some of them really getting into it then. Someone that hasn't been identified yet. There's a, one among you that you don't even know. And in fact, John says, I'm not even worthy to be his servant. I'm not even worthy to touch his feet. Can't you see some, some of the people are looking at, and then some of those self-righteous people, they're going, oh, is it, is it me? Is he, is he finally going to recognize me? But who's he talking about? He's talking about Jesus. He's talking about Jesus, the Son of God. And really, even though, even though in a crowd like that, Jesus could have been hidden because, because people would not have, have picked him out as being any different than you and I. You couldn't hide him. John says there's among you one that you, you don't know. Church, I want to know him. I, I really do. Even, even though the, the likelihood that, that I, would have, I would have been standing there with some of the people also wondering, who, who is this? Who, who's he going to point out? And if we were transported back there at, 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 the, at the edge of the Jordan River where all these people are going to be baptized, even knowing what's, what's happening, if you and I had looked at, at, at the crowd, we, we couldn't have singled him out. But I want to. I really, truly want to. And even in my weak moments, I, I, want, I still want to want to. There, there's not a time that I don't want to know Jesus. There are times. There are times that He is not as important to me as He should be. Do you feel that? Are there times like that in your days? Are there times like that where, where you may have gone half of the day and, and you go, I've been distracted. There, there are so many distractions. And, and, and listen, church, Jesus, Jesus understood that. In fact, in coming here, He got, he got rid of all of the distractions. He came for a purpose, and in order to accomplish that purpose, he, had, he, he understood, even far better than you and I can, that he had to get rid of all of the distractions. And so Philippians tells us in chapter 2, in verse 6 and 7, listen, listen to what he did. Who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. Something you have to hold on to. Something you have to hold on to. 
I, I saw on, on the reports about the Olympics that some of the men, that their, their team had, had won in, in some Olympic, and it may have even been the American people that, that, that won, and, and they had all got gold medals, and then they found out after the ceremony that they had given them the gold medals for the women's team. <laughs> And, and, and oh, you wouldn't want to take that medal home if, if, if you were a guy. And, and Well, they corrected it. They, they, they corrected it. But that, that gold medal would be something you'd want to hold on to. And, and, and nations are, 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 are boasting now about who, who got the most. And, and, and even those that, that did get the most, like Norway, they're, the world's putting them on a guilt trip. I mean, they, they excelled in so many things in the Winter Olympics. And, and, and it makes sense because they live in, in a winter kind of environment. But they, the world's telling them, you won too many medals. You should let other people win more medals. Well, I never won too many medals. So I, I guess that would, that would put me there. I, I don't want to be there saying... I helped other people win medals by my not winning them. You know, I, I was the, 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 the tr in, in track, I, I, was, I was the first place guy's best friend because I wasn't a threat to him. He knew he was going to come in first and that I was going to come in second. And I, even though I always wanted to be first, I didn't want to be first really truly at his expense. However, it would have been nice every once in a while. But look, look, what Je look what Jesus did. Listen, listen again to what he did. Though he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bond servant by choice, a servant by choice, and being made in the likeness of men. So he certainly understands. Made himself of no reputation is, is what some of our translations will say. And, and that's, that's exactly what he did. That's exactly what he did. And so whenever, whenever he stood in the crowd, often the crowd didn't even recognize him. He didn't single himself out. Oh, we worry too much. We, we get distraught. I do. I, there's, there's times I even get angry when I listen to the world speak against Jesus. When, when, when I hear world leaders or, or significant people in government, whether it's, it, it, it's a, on, on the city level or, or, or the, the state level or our federal level, when I hear judges or, or, or political leaders speak against Jesus, there are times whenever I hear it that, that I do get angry. And, and I think, who are you to be doing that? There are organizations that have committed themselves to eradicating the, the, the very thought, the very memory of Jesus. I resist that. The powerful speaking out against God. Can God handle that? Yeah. Is Jesus big enough to handle that? It is not Jesus is Lord if you take Him into your heart and believe that He is. No, it's not that at all. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. He's Lord by the proclamation of the Father. Because He met all of the criteria. God made Jesus both Lord and Christ. Both, both Lord over everything and our Messiah. Our Redeemer. Our salvation. And no one can change that. Even though many people have tried to change that. No, no one can. Jesus is, is still Lord. He, he will always be Lord. In in but back back in, in history, and I love to read the, the, the history of, of the world back 
when Jesus was living and before Jesus was living. And I, I love to read what history can be found about the time of, of Moses and, and even as far back as, and there's less and less of it recorded, all, all the way back to, to Abraham. And, and in, in AD 42, this, this was 40-something years before Jesus was born in the flesh, there was a big fight between the Romans. And it was over who's going to be the leader. And, and, and you've got some of these people's names that maybe you remember and maybe you don't. And, and uh, Octavian was one. And, and Mark Anthony, you, you, you've heard of Mark Anthony and Cleopatra. And, and they're on one side. And on the other side is, is Cassius. And, and you, you probably haven't heard of him, but you have heard of Brutus uh, if, in, in high school. Maybe, maybe nowhere else when, when, whenever you had to read some of Shakespeare's things. And in uh, uh, two Brute, uh, and you know, all right, it, it's time. It's time for us to settle this. And 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 so Octavian and Mark Anthony are on one side of this valley, and and, and Cassius and Brutus are on the other side of this valley, and, and it's a fight to the death between their armies. And, and when the smoke cleared, Octavian is still standing, and Brutus is still standing. It doesn't take long for Brutus to take care of, or Octavian to take care of Brutus. And so Octavian becomes the leader. And he changes his name to a name that's more familiar to us, Augustus Caesar. In the early time of Jesus, he's the one that, that commanded for the census when, when Joseph and Mary traveled from, from, from up in, in, in Nazareth all the way down to Bethlehem because that's, that's the... the that where their families were from, from the city of David, and, and they're of the lineage of Judah, and, and through uh, Judah, and then through David, here's, here's Joseph and Mary, both sides of the family. And so they travel down there for the census that Augustus Caesar ha has ordered. He became Caesar because of that battle that he won there outside of Philippi. So Philippi became a very significant place in his memory, in his thoughts. He, he, he traced his... His leadership, that's where it began. We all know where things began. Significant things began. And, and we remember those. And, and, and Augustus Caesar did. And he says, it, it was Philippi. And he had, he had fond memories of Philippi because he was the winner. And, and that opened the door for him to become the, 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 the ruler over all of Rome. And however far that empire would, would be extended. So he said, that, that, that was a good place in my memory. And so he made it by proclamation. He made it a Roman colony. Not just part of the Roman Empire, but he made it just like Rome. It was the little Rome. I mean, it was, it was the little Rome. And so it got special protection. And, and they got special money from, from Caesar. And, and, and it, it was a special place. And, and he... All over the city, as you're coming in the city, every direction that you could come in, in into the city, there, there was a sign that said, Augustus is Lord. Augustus is Lord. Caesar is Lord. And the people that, that really were caught up in that, and it, it was politics too, and the people there in Philippi that were caught up into it, they, they would make sure that, that Caesar is Lord, Augustus is Lord, was put on everything. And, and we, we found through archaeological discoveries that, that even on the library, here it was, it was, it was the, the city library, the, the city of, of Philippi had this great library, but, but Caesar gave money, Augustus gave money to even make it grander. And, and so they, uh, above their, their name, they put, Augustus is Lord. And that's where Paul, God has Paul go. And that's what we were just reading just a moment ago. He's, he, he's writing to the church in this city where everybody says, Augustus is Lord. God has Paul write to them. And he says, God has made Jesus both Lord and Christ. He says, God has given Jesus the name that is above every name. And God is laughing at Augustus. He's declared himself Lord. Is that a threat to anyone? Well, we would feel like it was. We'd feel like it was. 
That's, that's distracting from God. That, that's taking away from, from Jesus, who Jesus is. It probably grieves God. But it's not a threat to God. Does, does that change who Jesus is? No. No. Jesus is still Lord. Caesar is long gone. His, his tomb still holds his body. Jesus was raised from the dead. And God has made him both Lord and Christ. We worry too much. God said Jesus is Lord. We get distracted. The world does that. The world's good at that. And, and the world is, is in the lap of Satan, according to 1 John, in, in the, toward the end of your New Testament. Read that. Read all five chapters there and, and listen to what God is saying. He, he, all, the entire book is telling us how important Jesus is. That's what we need to hear. If, if you listen to the world, the whole world lies in the lap of Satan. And of course you're not going to hear that. And today we, we hear all of these things that divide us into so many different directions. We, we hear people saying, well, well, I'm, back then it would have been, I'm a Roman citizen. Roman citizenship was very important then. You got benefits if, if you're a Roman citizen. And, and so people are saying, you know, I'm a Roman citizen, but today you hear, I, I'm, I'm a Russian citizen. I'm, I, I'm, I'm a, a citizen of China. I'm an American citizen. I'm, I'm, I'm a citizen of, of Samoa. I'm a citizen of, of Japan. And what is God wanting us to hear? What is He wanting us to focus on? Stay in that same book. That same book where, where Augustus was, was saying so much and and, and wanting everybody to know that, that, that he, he was Lord. Listen to what God says in Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 20. He says, our citizenship, our citizenship, you want to know where your citizenship is? Our citizenship is in heaven. From which we also eagerly await for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of His glory. By the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. He said there's coming a day when, when Jesus is not only going to acknowledge who we are, but he's going to change us into being just exactly like him. And he's going to welcome us into our real home. Into our real country. Into our real land. Just like Abraham was looking for. A place whose builder and maker is God. And it won't make any difference then where we're from. Because God has, will have a people from every nation and every tribe and every language and every people. And we're all going to be there. And if we're not part of that nation, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. So don't, don't, let, don't, let, the, don't let the world distract you. A lot of people have tried. In the day of Jesus, Israel tried to get rid of Jesus. And Rome stepped in to help. The Gentiles got involved in it. They, they, they were going to help. And, and, and it hasn't just been them alone. In, in our time, the, the evolutionists tried to get rid of God and, and of Jesus. And, 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 and they, they, they have taken it to the highest court of our land. And, and, and they've, they've got prayer removed. They've had the Bible removed from school. And in any public, any public place that, that has any, any, any indication of an acknowledgement of God or of Jesus Christ or the Bible, they, they, they take people into court. They take people into court over having... A, a, a scene of, of the birth of Jesus at the holiday season. They take people into court if they say anything about Jesus at, at, at the Easter. They take people into court if, if, if they say anything about Jesus in the workplace. They're doing everything they can to take Jesus out of the world. And God is telling us, don't be distracted. Don't be distracted. For right now, we are in the world. Yeah, Islam tries. And they, and they don't just take you to court, they, they kill you. 
They, they kill you. And, and we see it over there on the other side of the ocean. And, and, and if, time, if time continues, hear, hear us, church. If time continues and, and we should live, it's going to be here. I mean, there's, there, there's not a wall around America. The United States is not the church. It's not the kingdom of heaven. And we see so many things changing and, and, and so many attacks. And, and, and God is saying, remember where your citizenship is. And remember that Jesus is still Lord. And there's coming a day when every knee will bow. Every knee will bow. Every person of Islam, every person of evolution, every person in the Roman Empire, long dead and gone, will be there. And they, every person of the Jewish faith who, who persecuted the early church, their knees will bow and their tongues will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Listen to what God is saying. Jesus is still Lord. They killed Him. They buried Him. It still wasn't enough. They sealed the grave. Still wasn't enough. They, they put a guard on the tomb. They put a guard on the tomb, rotating 24 hours a day. They're going to have someone there guarding that tomb. And they guarded it for three days. But Jesus is Lord. So it didn't change anything, did it? I mean, the will of God will be accomplished. And we feel intimidated. Today, Christianity gets bad press. Front page. Not back page, front page. Followers of Jesus are persecuted. Bibles are burned. We hear jeers and sneers. We're mocked, laughed at, ridiculed. If you say too much about Jesus, you get in trouble. You can be reprimanded, you can lose your job. Our judicial system isn't always helpful because often they themselves feel this way. But Jesus is still Lord. Jesus is Lord. Don't forget that. Don't forget that. That's, that's what this entire book is about. From the very beginning to the very end, it is all about Jesus being Lord. And nothing in this world will change it. Nothing in this world will change that. God's plea for us, Jesus' plea for us, is to not let anything in the world change us. You see, the world does really good at changing people. I mean, the, the, the kind of toothpaste we use... The, the, the kind of, of now, now Clarence and I, uh, we balance each other out. He, he doesn't use as many hair products as I do. He doesn't need to. But see, that way the hair, the hair industry and the hair products industry is still able to function. See, they, they, don't, go, they don't go belly up. And, and, but we, we listen to what kind of cars to buy. We, we listen to what kind of food to have. Well, even, even where to go and buy your food. We're told what to think about different people whenever elections come around, and it seems now like the election season never ends. Do you, do you get that feeling? And it's okay to go like this in church. And it's even okay to say, that's right, preacher. I mean, it, it just, it's in our faith. And, and why you need to, to, to support this person, or, or why you need to not support this person, and, and really, the, the truth is, at the end, none of that matters. None of that matters. I'm not going to fight you or argue with you over who you want to vote for. As long as I know that above everything else, you're voting for Jesus. The world cannot change 
the fact that Jesus is Lord. But God knows that the world can change you. That's where His heart is. Don't let anyone take away your crown was the words of God to one of the churches of Asia in the book of Revelation. Don't let anyone take your crown. Satan wants it. Satan wants it. Question this morning. It's one that only you can answer in your life. In all of your life is Jesus still Lord. If he's not, you need to make some changes. Not for me, not for the church, but for yourself. And you need to make them today. Don't put it off any longer. Come right now while we stand and while we sing.